Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a good session with Lightning Talks and you took five minutes to you know, refresh. I'm very excited about this session because partly I'm moderating it and partly we have three amazing speakers, Francoise, Ravi, and Hubert. So next slide, please. Yesterday, um, we talked a lot about privacy and we talked a lot about applications of federated learning, especially in Android 12, in smart selection, in Google Keyboard, health studies, Android messages. And so today, we're going to give you a very nice overview about federated analytics applications and algorithms, federated learning algorithms and uh, applications, and also how we can build an infrastructure and scale it up. Next slide, please. So we talked a lot about privacy and trust and security, but there are a lot of things that are very interesting other than just privacy and trust. And for instance, we may want to expand the set of problems that we are working on, go from say supervised machine learning to unsupervised or semi-supervised machine learning, do personalization, tackle new domains, you know, in addition to text, go to images and speech and others. So today, next slide, we have Francoise to tell us about some of these new exciting applications of federated learning at Google, how we're scaling this technology to new domains. Francoise, please take it away. Thank you, Peter. Can we get the next slide? So the, the topic that I've picked um, to talk to you about is the Hey Google model, uh, which I will refer to as Hey G because if I say the whole thing, my phone will keep beeping all the time. Um, and uh, this is a model that we're training with federated learning in American English um, for the Google Assistant. Next slide, please. So what is the Hey G model? Well, when uh, you say something to your Google Assistant, such as Hey G, what time is it? Um, there is a hot word model that detects if the user, in this case myself, intends to speak to the assistant and to activate it. And if uh, the conclusion is that, yes, the user intended to activate the assistant, then we send the audio to the server, or in some cases, uh, keep it on the device if recognition is happening there. And if no, we drop the audio. And the hot word model obviously is used on a whole bunch of surfaces from those small um, you know, Google devices all the way to smart displays or to Pixel phones. Next slide, please. So at the high level, the architecture is a little bit more sophisticated than just a, a hot word model. There is a, a first model, which is what we call the course model, that's really there mostly as a um, you know, a pre-filter, essentially. It's a low latency, low precision type of model that just checks if there is something going on uh, that might indicate that the user wants to talk to Google. And then there is the hot word model per se, who will decide whether to reject the audio or whether to accept it. Then there is, in uh, most use cases, a speaker ID model that will decide if you are the person that the device is expecting or one of the people the device is expecting and either reject or accept you. And then from there, on some surfaces where it's possible, the audio is sent to the server where there is yet another test happening uh, to further check if the audio was meant for Google or not, which results again in an acceptance or rejection. Next slide, please. And so the model that we'll talk about is that hot word model in the uh, green box here, which runs on device. Next slide, please. So why do we do federated learning in this case? Um, as you can imagine, when, you know, given the, the description from the previous slide, the production logs uh, that we may have for this type of model are not very rich. And the reason is kind of coming from both ends. If the hot word didn't trigger, then we have to assume that the audio was not meant for Google, and so we delete it, right? So we cannot log it. And if instead the hot word triggers, but there are other signals that indicate that maybe that audio wasn't meant for Google, then again, we assume it wasn't meant for Google, so we delete the audio and we cannot log it. 
So you see from both ends of the spectrum, both false accept and false rejects, those, the interesting samples from a technical viewpoint are the samples that we cannot log because that would be an infraction of user privacy. Next slide. And so, yes, the near activations are not logged and the misactivations are not logged. So the data that we have to train such a model server set is, is very uh, underrepresentative of the actual use cases. Next slide, please. And so federated learning comes in here to essentially give us more flexibility. The on-device processing allows us to have a concept of training cache that remains on the device where we can potentially keep more data than the samples that we would log on the server. Now, this is still happening, of course, with explicit user content, consent, sorry. So we do cache the data on their device with an opt-in, obviously. But then with their opt-in, we can keep that data there for a period of time and do federated learning on it. And so what the picture shows here is that there essentially, if you look at the model scores on the y-axis, there are different thresholds. There's the hot word threshold that says, you know, if we recognize hey, G with higher score than a given threshold, then we assume that it's something that we should accept. But there is a threshold underneath where we can assume that those samples were near acceptance and that therefore we can keep them on the cache. And so essentially we're looking at the, um, the ensemble of all the um, audio signals that are coming to the system and saying any signal that's close enough to the boundaries where we need to make the decision of accept, reject, those are the signals that we're trying to keep. And those that are far away, we don't even keep them in the cache because presumably they're less interesting and we certainly don't want the cache to be something that's just grabbing all the audio uh, around you. So we're just picking those samples that are most important to precisely defining the, the, the hot word threshold boundary. Now, that's just a question of getting the samples in the cache, but there are many more challenges ahead of us if we want to make the model work well um, when training a federated setting. Next slide, please. So if you go back and if uh, you guys have seen talks from our group uh, in the last few years, you may have heard us talk a lot about Gboard and next word prediction. And we started doing federated learning in production in that setup because it was a little bit easier, mostly because um, network prediction has very clear training samples. When you cache the words that the user is typing, if they have typed two words and you need to predict the third one, the only thing that you have to do is wait till they type the third one and you know that you have a sample there that you should have predicted correctly, right? So the training targets, the, the training labels are very simple. In the case of the hot words, it's not like that because we will cache audio samples and the user doesn't have any kind of incentive for going to their cache or, or to the UI and you know making any kind of obvious decision that would label the sample. So that is the core complexity that comes with this type of system where user feedback is not absolutely obvious. So we'll get into that in the next slide. And so the thing that we did here is to adopt a teacher-student, actually noisy uh, teacher-student approach. So we have labeled data, which is the data that we're normally using to train uh, the, the hot word model and we do some, you know, kind of data augmentation. We'll talk a little bit more about it. But in the case of federated learning, we use that model that was trained server side as a teacher for a student that resides on the device. And in that case, we can do more aggressive data augmentation um, to get um, soft labels. Uh, from the teacher and then train based on that. So essentially we minimize across entropy loss um, that's based on the soft teacher logics. Now, 
of course, you will say, well, the user signals as well, right? When a user is interacting with their device, they will do things like saying, hey, uh, go back, no, don't do this, or they will click on the home button. So there are also user signals that can be folded in the system, but we start with just a simple teacher-student approach. Next slide, please. Now, there's data that we have on the server, which is the data that we're normally using uh, to train the hot word model. And that data contains different things. They contain true positives. So the cases where we assume based on the production system that the user meant to talk to Google and they did. But we also have hard negatives that are coming from data collections that we've done. So not user data and, and data that we can use to train the system. And that data, of course, is valuable, right? Since it was used to produce a production model, we can assume as a federated learning team that that's data that we might be interested in. So what we ended up doing here is actually doing a mix between federated learning and central training, where we have those two pipelines that come together to produce a model that derives from both sources of data. And um, there is another talk uh, in this workshop by Andrew Hard. Uh, we'll be taking you into more details on that topic. Next slide, please. So some of the challenges of training on device, and, and there are many of them, uh, have to do with data augmentation, because the type of data augmentations that we use in the, in the speech team are pretty expensive. One of them is what we call MTR, or multi-style training. And it's essentially a mix of additive noise and room reverberation. And so we have a, a room model, essentially, and we can use the data and reverberate it under controlled settings and then add noise to it. And those libraries are pretty heavy from a computational load viewpoint and, and from just a, a size viewpoint, because they're typically used server side. So we had the choice between trying to shrink those libraries to make them fit on device or looking into different approaches. And we found um, another approach uh, that's called spec augment, uh, which um, turned out to be pretty effective in this case. It's uh, essentially an approach that takes the waveform and tries to make transformations of it by doing either time warping or frequency uh, masking or time masking. And so you can mix those transformations and generate samples based on that. And interestingly, what we found out in this case is that spec augment was actually working better than the technique that was used in production so far. Um, and it's also converging a lot faster. So then that technique was adopted in production as well. So see, that's one case where doing research in federated learning actually directly benefited the production system, not so much because of federated learning, but because it was another team looking at the problem with different constraints and just you know coming up with different solutions. Next slide, please. Um, the other uh, issue that we had when training on device was a question of convergence. If you have a data set and you have a model and you can train it on the server, it doesn't really matter how long it takes. It's a small model. Um, if it takes one day or if it takes two days, who cares, right? You just come back and get the stuff trained. But when you have to train it with federated learning on device, then training speed really matters. And so we started looking into different um, training optimizers. The, the production system was trained with SGD, so we looked into Adam which was, you know, adapted to, to be the federated atom, uh, which works better. But then we looked into Yogi, uh, which is also uh, one of those adaptive uh, optimizer, which turned out to work even better, uh, even though it has a kind of a weird loss function where it plateaus for a long time, and then all of a sudden it, uh, it decides to go for it and you know, starts dropping, but typically ends up in fewer iteration with a better optimum. So we adopted Yogi as the, the optimizer for the hot word. Next slide, please. And then from there, you know, there's a whole bunch of other practicalities. Um, typically the, the code that's being used is code that was built for uh, server-based server -based training. So we need to adopt it, shrink it, optimize it, uh, to fit on the on the clients, 
Um, one thing to keep in mind when you're looking into production with federated learning is that if there is any kind of TensorFlow operation or you know whichever library you're using uh, that you have defined and that you need for your federated learning runs, uh, they need to land on the device, right? So there is typically a production cycle that may be many weeks long and you need to wait till the next production cycle so that you can push the code to the user's devices and, and use it. You have to pay attention to system health, obviously. Uh, you don't want the, the phone or the device to burn because you're doing federated learning on it. So we did a lot of work in this case since it's audio signal, which again is a little bit heavier than Gboard typing. Um, we did a lot of things to make sure that the capture of the audio doesn't happen uh, at a point where it would disturb the user in their uh, normal operation. Um, we did a lot of, you know, best effort essentially processing since federated learning uh, is not essential to the functioning of the device. If we lose a few samples, that's okay. Uh, we did a lot of compression as well of the audio to, to not occupy too much space on the device. And then, of course, federated learning, um, you know, tends to run a little bit slower than running stuff on device. So experimentation is a bit heavier and debugging is hard. Debugging remains maybe the, the most complicated issue with federated learning because the samples are in the training cache and you just don't have access to it. Next slide, please. So with this, at the moment, we're at a place where um, if you look at the, the plot here, we have different data sets um, and different characteristics that are comparing central training to federated training. Um, you can see that, you know, on average, we're doing good. It's about the same quality as the central model, which is already uh, pretty interesting, right? It's a very good result. Um, but depending on the data set, sometimes we're a little bit worse, sometimes we're a little bit better. And that is not something that can be put in production at the moment because we need to be better everywhere. There cannot be any kind of uh, regression there. So we're still optimizing the system. And I, I think, again, Andrew's talk will give you a little bit more background on, on how we want to mix the, uh, the two types of training and get better characteristics there. Next slide, please. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Francoise. Um, we're constantly um, pleasantly surprised and amazed by how many teams are actually using federated learning at Google, whether in experimentation, production, or deployment. But next slide, please. One of the technologies that actually are is is needed by pretty much everybody is federated analytics. So a lot of people are doing learning and training models, but pretty much every single team we talk to wants to do some kind of analytics. So analytics is a data science setting where multiple entities collaborate in solving a data analytics problem under the coordination of a central service provider. And NFA only focused updates that are intended for immediate aggregation are used to achieve the objective. Next slide, please. So here are some applications of federated analytics. One of them is, for instance, we may want to discover uh, and learn geolocation heat maps. These are multidimensional histograms, heat maps. Another one is we may want to discover frequently typed out of dictionary words, trending words due to, for instance, a pandemic or a concert, a new release of an album, so on and so forth. Or we may want to just find popular songs, trending music, activities, habits, behaviors, so on and so forth. So you should think of federated analytics as basically answering questions over a data set rather than specifically just training a neural network on a data set. Next slide, please. And some of the uh, algorithms under federated analytics are, we go all the way from binary real sums, vector or scalar, to dense sparse sums, histograms, counters, heavy hitters, heat maps, uh, learning hierarchical histograms to do range queries, quantiles, CDFs, counting distinct elements, clustering dimensionality reduction, and if you really want to open up the space of possibilities, you should think of any SQL-like query. How do we do it on massively decentralized data? So obviously, there's no way we can cover all these algorithms and topics, but we're very excited about all of them. In this talk, we're mostly going to see how we can do binary real sums. Next slide, please. 
And we're going to talk about how do we do it under different flavors of differential privacy, whether it's the local, distributed, or central. So next slide, please. To do that, I'm very excited uh, to have Ravi Kumar with us today to tell us about the work his team is doing. Ravi, the floor is yours. Thanks, uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, thanks, Peter, Marco, and Brendan for inviting me. Uh, I am Ravi from Research. I hope you can see the slides advancing. Uh, Not yet. You have to. Maybe someone has to pin your slides. Okay, good. Yeah. So I'm advancing my own slides. So. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about a basic problem in federated analytics, which is how to do binary summation in a distributed manner uh, with uh, differential privacy. So to do this, let us first recall the uh, definition of uh, differential privacy. Uh, I'm sure most of you know this definition by heart by now, uh, especially after the workshop, right? So in DP, we have uh, n users, x1 through x, each user holding a value xi. And the goal is to estimate some function f of x1 through xn. And these users send messages y1 through yn to an analyzer that takes all these messages and then somehow uses them to compute this estimate. Uh, so this uh, differential privacy, intuitively the definition, definition I've put up, tries to capture the fact that changing a single user's input should not affect the algorithm by too much. And there are two parameters, epsilon and delta. And think of epsilon as being a constant and delta something like a one over polynomial in n. And smaller the value of epsilon, the higher the privacy guarantees are. Okay. In the original central model proposed by uh, Dwork et al. in their uh, 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 well-known paper, the privacy guarantee is on the output of the analyzer. In other words, the output of the analyzer must be differentially private according to the definition. A few years down the road, there was a local model proposed by a bunch of people where it had slightly stronger guarantees in the sense that each message sent by a user has to be differentially private. The local model is, has a stricter notion of privacy because every, use, every message leaving a user's device is guaranteed to be private. So since it is stricter, in a sense, it incurs more error. So the local model is preferable but at the same time, the error in the estimate of the function tends to be higher, probably higher than the central model. In, in general, it, the whole thing depends on who do you trust, right? You can think of the whole thing as in the central model as users sending messages to like a trusted party, say a trusted um, execution environment, and then that is able to estimate the value f. Or in other settings, you could, be, uh, you could have protocols that are based on MPCs. So you could have a bunch of trusted helpers uh, uh, wh whom you trust, who communicate with each other in order to compute this function. The researchers have been trying to come up with models that sit somewhere between the central model and the local model in terms of the trust and uh, accuracy and the privacy utility trade-off. And one particularly interesting model is the shuffle model that was proposed in a series of papers, where the setup is same as before, except that there is a shuffler that sits between the user's message and the analyzer. Think of the shuffler as taking all the user's inputs, uh, user's messages, and then randomly permuting them, applying some permutation pi, and then sends the uh, permuted uh, messages to the analyzer, which once again uses some algorithm to estimate the desired function f. Okay. And unlike the previous settings uh, here, what we really want is that the shuffle messages have to be differentially private. That's the requirement here. Okay. In other words, equivalently, the multi-set of messages sent by the user have to be different, has to be differentially private. And this is uh, known by uh, different names, such as anonymous model in the crypto setting or the encode shuffle analyze architecture uh, proposed by a bunch of people in, in Google, or the ESA architecture. Why is shuffling interesting? It turns out that any local DP algorithm can be used to give a shuffle DP algorithm, but with a much, much smaller epsilon. And that's called the amplification by shuffling. And that's the reason why shuffling is very interesting. Because remember, uh, small epsilon means better privacy. And therefore, by just putting a shuffler in between the user messages and the analyzer, one could amplify uh, or improve the privacy guarantees. Okay. okay. 
So we, all, we also look at a slightly enhanced version of the shuffle model. In the previous slide, I, I mentioned that every user sends one message, but I can make it more general. Uh, in this multi-message shuffle model, every user sends more than one message. It could be like the user i could be sending y1 through yi number of messages. And the total number of the shuffler just treats these messages as a, as a big uh, multi-set, shuffles them, randomly permutes them, and sends them to the analyzer. So the number of messages is like d1 through dn. This is the multi-message shuffle model. Okay. So now that we have set up the uh, basic DP models, how do we how do we do distributed privacy at scale? Okay. So I'd like to say there are three major dimensions here. Of course, two are very obvious. One is the accuracy and utility. We want to estimate the function f with as much accuracy as high accuracy as possible. Of course, this means that add as little noise as possible. On the other hand, we also want the protocol to be differentially private in whatever model we look at, central, local, uh, or distributed, or shuffle any model. That means we need to have sufficient noise to make sure that the DP guarantees are satisfied. A third important uh, uh, aspect of this whole setup is communication. So since we want the whole thing to scale with uh, millions of users and so on, we want each user to send as few bits to the analyzer as possible. So in other words, the communication has to be efficient. And this was addressed in some paper uh, Peter and a bunch of others wrote. OK. So with this whole uh, task in mind, trying to find the good trade-off between uh, utility and privacy, and all, as well as reducing communication, let's look at a basic problem, which, which we call binary summation. So in this setup, you have n users, x1 through xn, where each user holds a bit, either 0 or 1. And the function that we are trying to estimate is just a sum of all these bits. It's a very, very basic problem. Right? It's a binary summation problem. And of course, you can generalize it a little bit more to the real summation, where every user, instead of having a bit, has a number between 0 and 1. So we would like to solve this problem uh, in a distributed manner, in a differentially private distributed manner. Okay? And why is this an interesting uh, uh, task? So in fact, summation turns out to be like, uh, in addition to being a basic federated aggregation task, it's also a core ML primitive. Um, so in fact, if you take any supervised learning methods, like for example, gradient descent and so on, when you do a gradient update, you're essentially doing a vector summation or vector averaging in a distributed way. Or even if you take unsupervised methods like uh, Lloyd's iteration to do k-means, whenever you recompute the center, you're doing a summation of all the uh, uh, points in the cluster to compute the new center. That's another summation instance. In fact, this is true for most EM-like algorithms. And if you take iterator methods like a page rank or any other matrix vector computation, once again, it involves weighted summation. So summation of real numbers or real vectors is such a basic task that we would like to uh, address that. OK, well, let's, let's look at binary summation. What is known in this, uh, 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 what is known for this problem? So in the central model, uh, the famous paper of uh, Duang et al. and later uh, taken by uh, Ghosh et al. showed that you can achieve order one over epsilon error where every user sends exactly one bit to the analyzer. In fact, if you go to the local model, as I said, the error has to be higher. And in fact, you can get a square root n error, which is, turns out to be tight, by a very old mechanism called the randomized response uh, stated way back in the 60s. And once again, the number of user number of bits sent by each user is exactly one. Okay. And by the amplification by shuffling, you can take the same randomized response protocol and improve the error to square root of log one over delta by epsilon. So in the basic binary summation in the central and local models, you don't have delta. In other words, the mechanism is pure DP. But once you go to the shuffle model, you get incurred this delta error. But still, the error is much less than what you can get using the local model. And if you insist on every user sending exactly one message, an earlier work uh, with Abadi and Pasan and, and others showed that you have to incur a lower bound of uh, square root of log one over delta error. So in other words, the gold gold standard we are looking for is trying to approach a central error, which is log, which is order one over epsilon. That you cannot achieve by just having every user send exactly one message. So we have to somehow break this uh, barrier. So this barrier is already broken. So uh, there was a paper, a bunch of papers by uh, different authors that showed how to achieve one over epsilon error. But the bottleneck was that every user ends up sending more than one bit. In particular, they essentially send log n number of 
But as I try to argue, communication is a big barrier in trying to make this thing scale. Therefore, we'd like to reduce the communication as much as possible, which is going to be the focus of the rest of the talk. So where we'll come up with an algorithm that achieves a central error where every user essentially sends one bit. So basically, it's as good as you can get. But at the same time, we are getting the uh, one hour epsilon error guarantee of the central model. The whole thing is done in the sh multi message shuffle mode. So to state the algorithm, uh, let's go to the uh, what is standard, what is called the additive noise mechanism used in many protocols, where the standard setup, every user has uh, a bit xi, and we would like to compute uh, the sum x1 through xn. What you typically do in additive noise mechanism is to you add a noise drawn from a certain distribution. And if you draw this noise from a discrete Laplace distribution, then this mechanism is optimal to estimate the sum in the central model. And for, uh, for uh, completeness, the discrete Laplace mechanism, uh, uh, discrete Laplace distribution is given by the definition uh, here. Okay. And this is a central protocol model where it achieves an error of one over epsilon. What we would like to do is to kind of mimic this protocol in the distributed setting. To do this, you need a simple notion called infinite divisible distributions. It's a very simple notion. Uh, mathematically, it's the following. A distribution is infinitely divisible if for every positive integer n, there exists a distribution d slash n, such that if you take n copies of this d slash n and add them up, I get back the original distribution d. Think of the way to split this d in terms of this n identical copies. Okay. And that's their distribution is very equivalent. And in fact, many well-known distributions have this property. For example, the Poisson or the negative binomial are all infinitely, infinitely divisible. And one good news is that the discrete Laplace, which you use for the central model, can be expressed as a difference of two negative binomial. Okay. Uh, since this individually, these two negative binomials are infinite, infinitely divisible, the discrete Laplace is also infinitely divisible. So one technical aspect, which turns out to be very important, is that the Poisson and negative binomial distributions are defined over non-negative integers, whereas discrete Laplace is defined over all integers. This turns out to be very crucial in our uh, algorithm. So with this in mind, let's try to use this infinite divisibility to mimic the central algorithm in the distributed setting. The idea is very simple. So each user samples a random variable z according to d slash n. That's the basic component of the infinite divisible distribution. And then the user adds their message x and then computes a the number z plus x and then sends all messages like uh, bits one, x plus z times. That's the whole protocol. Now, what does the analyzer do? The analyzer just returns some of all the messages. Okay. And let's try to analyze the utility of this. The analyzer view is just a number of one from all the users. And um, it's basically x1 through xn plus d. And why is it d? Because remember, every user generates d slash n from the infinite divisible distribution. So when you sum all of them up, you get back d, which is great. You know, this is exactly the additive noise mechanism that you want in central model. So all is good. But what's got goes wrong? The problem is that this works only if z, the random variable I generated here, takes support only on non-negative integers. In fact, there is actually a bad news here. Informally, you can show that if you try to use non-negative d, then you cannot get over the error without depending on uh, delta. So basically, you will get back the uh, error as before. So you want to actually avoid this. So how do we avoid this? Instead of every user sending exactly one, the user can also send minus one. That's one idea here. So instead of um, each user sampling only from one uh, infinite divisible distribution, they sample z and z minus from uh, infinite divisible distribution, and then sends z plus x messages of one and z minus messages of minus one. Okay, so to cancel it out. So the analyzer, as before, just returns all the sum of all the messages, and the analyzer view is number of plus ones it receives and number of minus ones it receives, right? And the if you choose the distribution d to be carefully say negative binomial, then since a negative binomial minus negative binomial is discrete Laplace, you get a uh, utility same as discrete Laplace, so all set. Except there's a catch here. The privacy does not work. 
because it's a technical reason, but the number of ones that received the, received by the analyzer contains more information than you would actually uh, ideally desire. And therefore, we need to fix this, actually. And this is the final algorithm. The final algorithm is essentially the same as before, except that you need to add uh, extra noise, which is given by another infinite divisible distribution, d prime. What uh, the each user does is that they send z plus y plus x messages of one, and then they send z minus plus y messages of minus one. And the nice thing is that the analyzer can be the same as before, return the sum of all the messages, and the y's cancel nicely, it doesn't affect the accuracy, and you get back the same as the central mechanism, the, uh, the noise added there, and you can also show that the uh, privacy holds if we choose d prime to be sufficiently uh, high uh, uh, mean, which it turns out to be log squared, log squared is enough. Actually, log is enough, but I updated the slides, but it's not showing you. Okay, so that's uh, that's the whole idea here. So d prime is chosen to exactly destroy the correlations that caused by the original distribution. Okay, so that's the main thing. And here is the uh, and the communication complexity you can analyze just a uh, uh, linear expectation. It show it turns out that the uh, number of bits sent by every user is exactly one plus some little of n, little of one. Okay. And so this is the main result. Um, sorry, it's a huge lag here. Uh, so we got uh, epsilon delta shuffled algorithm, which achieves the same error as a central DP uh, discrete Laplace mechanism, uh, where in expectation every user sends one plus little of n, little of one messages, and each message is exactly one bit. And what uh, what we are, what we can do is that we can take this algorithm and extend to other cases like the histogram case, where again we get the same central DP uh, error with a very small number of messages, and also to the uh, real summation case, which goes through a, a problem called delta summation. I'll, I'll skip all these details. Okay, what are the main takeaway, takeaways? Or uh, the main takeaways from uh, what I want to say is that communication efficiency is very important to handle scale. And the protocols that uh, uh, I presented are simple enough for practitioners to use. And uh, the shuffle model is very powerful. And it's possible to achieve central error with, uh, um, with, uh, with uh, uh, it's possible to achieve central error with, um, with, uh, with very low communication. Okay. And with that, I'll stop. I'll, I'm over time. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Ravi. Um, so if we can go back a few slides. I think we're in Hubert's section. All right, so yeah, one more. Can we go back one more slide? Can we go back one more time? So I'll stop presenting and maybe it's easier. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think the, they should pin the main deck. Um, all right, so as Ravi said, uh, there's a lot of opportunities in studying joint privacy, accuracy, communication trade-offs, even in the simplest uh, tasks such as binary or real sums for federated analytics um, in, in all flavors of differential privacy. Uh, but from what Ravi presented and the algorithms that we are interested in, you can see that the nature of federated analytics computations is a bit different from federated learning. For instance, in federated analytics, to get that amplification gain, uh, we can actually have very large batches with millions of clients. Whereas in optimization, we get quickly saturation of utility because we just need to estimate the gradient, have a good enough estimate of the gradient. Another thing is interactivity tends to be less important or interesting in federated analytics. So it's unclear if there is an advantage of talking to the same clients more than once. And so, because of these very interesting uh, differences in uh, characteristics between analytics and learning, and they also share some things in common, building a platform to run these computations seamlessly at scale is challenging in itself. Next slide, please. So to talk about these systems and scale challenges of running both analytics and learning, Hubert is now going to present how we were able to do it at Google. Hubert, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Um, I uh, will talk about Google's cross-device platform today. 
Um, there are, of course, a lot of other platforms by Facebook and Apple or cross silo platforms. I will focus on this cross device platform we built here, the first of its kind and the largest in terms of scale that we operate. And what I would like to achieve with this uh, talk is primarily sharing challenges that we encounter um, that we believe are interesting for an external audience. So to set that stage, I want to first recap the system that we have today. We published a summary at SysML a couple of years ago and have updated it a bit since. And I will then talk about the major challenges that we face. I, all right. Um, so we started building our platform in 2016, primarily to enable federated learning as outlined in the original federated averaging paper and with built-in support for secure aggregation. In particular, it was designed to run synchronous and iterative processes, such as um, synchronous um, gradient descent. I think the audience is largely familiar with the basic procedure, but I quickly want to recap it to point out some details that will be relevant for the rest of this talk. Uh, around starts with devices waking up when their device conditions allow, such as charging, unmetered network, idle. And they connect to the server, and this timing of when devices wake up is largely outside our control. The server waits until enough devices have connected, rejecting superfluous devices and such without outdated software, and then serves a payload. In our case, that's a TensorFlow model or query to the device. In the next stage, devices run this computation, um, training or analytics, and report results back to the server, where uh, these results are aggregated and released if enough devices have reported, otherwise we discard them. That aggregation can be done with the secure aggregation protocol, in which case uh, there will be a couple more back and forths between client and server than shown in this picture. One key detail here is uh, that devices are unreliable. They may have poor network connections, they may get interrupted, they may just take too long. So we have built redundancy into the system by over allocating devices to rounds. And of course, um, since uh, we invented the system, we have made many gradual improvements since the first iteration. I've listed a couple here. For example, the ability for devices to select workloads that they are eligible for that allows us to th do things like filtering out devices without training data or sampling devices without replacement. We relax synchronicity requirements a bit uh, via batched incremental execution of rounds. And we also support non-federated computations. We call those local computations. Those are tasks um, such as a personalization training. But conceptually, this whole system is still fairly similar to uh, the system L paper. One key aspect for as a, a practical consideration that I want to call out here is that this system is designed um, and run as a multi-tenant platform that different teams and people can use. There are probably on the order of um, hundreds of uh, engineers that directly or indirectly depend on this platform. And without going into specific numbers, we are operating at a fairly large scale in terms of number of devices and network traffic, probably many, many, many million devices. All of this taken together leads to a set of rather unique challenges we're facing. And I want to share a bit more about those uh, in the following slides. All right, first off, I'd like to discuss uh, somewhat non-federated challenges um, that are inherent to large scale mobile deployments. Of course, we have various resource constraints on phones, disk size, network, especially when we are on a metered connection, memory constraints, and time. Uh, we can only run for around 10 minutes in the background on Android. These constraints, of course, impact modeling, as we all know. Um, one may have to use quantization, model compression, dropout, etc. But these constraints also have far-reaching consequences for developing the platform. In particular, limits around code size and long latencies for rollouts force us to make many compromises, such as using stripped down versions of full TensorFlow, which in turn makes it more challenging to use the platform and to bring about change and innovations. Like, to give you one example here, um, adding 50 kilobytes for a new TensorFlow op is a big deal for us. 
and getting that up out to enough phones uh, to use it takes weeks or months. And more transformative changes, such as a change in the network protocol, can easily take a year from design phase to a complete rollout. I don't want to go into more detail in this talk really about these restrictions, but I wanted to call them out because they are deal breakers for many innovations. Um, so I think there's something that the audience uh, should be aware of. We simply cannot ship a Python runtime or full TensorFlow. And those limitations can also lead to an occasionally frustrating user experience and be in the way of wider adoption. The next challenge I wanted to talk about is monitoring and debugging. Uh, Francois already alluded to that. For the platform code, we have a similar challenge that modelers do. Um, we want to monitor and debug the system while learning as little as possible about individual devices. Of course, we try to catch problems before they even happen in production through extensive test infrastructure. For instance, all of our models get automatically tested for compatibility and with a target runtime and for policy compliance before we deploy them. But still, many problems only manifest in the real world, on real phones, on real data, or in scenarios that we cannot or did not think of covering and testing. And that's why we need telemetry. One such example from the real world was a software bug that only happened on a subset of ARM devices. And debugging such problems is especially hard in the federated setting, where by design, we do not have access to data or individual gradients. But telemetry needs to be used with care. For instance, uploading error messages is problematic because they could leak data. Or even less innocuous data, such as the timing of training, can be too sensitive to collect. We think that federated technologies, federated analytics in particular, may offer a solution here, such as private heavy hitters, to say, collect the top tens of low error messages that occur during training in a privacy preserving way. And such a solution is likely going to be applicable to telemetry from other apps than our own platform as well, of course. So we think this is a pretty exciting field for um, wider adoption. There are challenges here, of course, compared to traditional telemetry, such as latency, precision, recall, bias, and also ease of adoption. The next uh, challenge is uh, participation bias. So this is an area we have invested quite a bit of time into, um, so I created a couple of extra slides for this topic. Bias in federated learning or federated analytics can occur for a variety of reasons, some of which are, we are not positioned well to address as a platform owner, such as bias data collection. We decided to focus in on one type of bias that we call participation bias. That is the tendency of some devices to contribute more than others to the final result. I'd be happy to discuss the definition of bias, of statistical bias and ML bias more offline. Here we'll focus on this platform aspect, participation bias. To address that sort of bias, we need to at first understand why devices participate differently and quantify that extent of differences. One thing I want to make clear here is differences in participation rates do not necessarily mean that the result will be biased. For that, these differences in participation rates must correlate with the underlying data distribution. In, for a successful contribution to a round, a sequence of steps must occur. I listed them in this table. First of all, devices must wake up and invoke the federated learning code. That depends on the device's availability. It is very dependent on the device class we're talking about. Phones are particularly challenging. Whereas, say, devices that are permanently connected to network or power are likely less restricted. Invocation patterns will also vary across operating system versions. And in fact, we have seen quite significant differences across, Android, uh, across manufacturers and Android versions in wake-up behavior, likely because of OEM modifications to the shop scheduler. The next step, a device needs to connect to the server and it needs to be selected for a round. This is an example of where system design choices can impact bias. We decided to go with a round-based synchronous execution scheme in our system and only admit a certain number of devices to a round. That means that at times when a lot of devices connect to our server, 
the chance of an individual device to be selected is lower. And since devices typically follow a diurnal activity pattern more active at nighttime, this can cause participation bias and, in effect, biased results. That is a design choice we made. One could also imagine a system where any device gets accepted. I believe that's, in effect, what um, Facebook or, or Meta has built. But um, that is the choice that we went with a couple of year, years ago. The final stage, um, a device must successfully execute the computation, upload its results, and these results must be included by the server and the final aggregate. And device performance, network connection, amount of data on device matter here for uh, two reasons. First, there are hard errors, like the computation being interrupted by the user or the operating system, or a bad network connection causing the upload to fail or timeout. The bigger the model, the more likely such errors are. The second type of failure mode is that the server might stop aggregating after receiving enough reports, whatever that means. So slower devices, devices with more data might not make it. More generally speaking, one thing we have observed is any sort of cutoff, such as thresholds or timeouts built into the system, say requiring a certain number of devices to start or to finish around, stopping after some period has passed. Any such cutoff has a tendency to introduce a competitive nature. And in this competition, slower devices tend to lose. For completeness, I have added uh, some major mitigations here, and there are more. I wrote about this topic in the Advances in Open Problems paper that I linked to here at the bottom of the slide. Um, I want to finish this slide by emphasizing that participation bias and biased results are very real. We have seen them on various occasions and probably been unaware on many other occasions when they exist. For example, we have seen the devices with more data tend to have a lower chance of contributing, probably because the computation takes longer. And I've mentioned before, we've seen participation differences across manufacturers and OS, OS versions. We have seen bias in computed statistics, where we happen to be able to compare those statistics with uh, another telemetry system. Typically, of course, we cannot make such comparisons. An important takeaway um, that I want to emphasize is that platform design choices can affect the extent of bias and hence need to take that concern into account. The final challenge I want to discuss is the edge neural runtime that we use. An ideal on-device neural runtime would check a lot of boxes. Its binary should be small. It should be performant. That means it should be fast, have a low memory footprint, be energy efficient. It should also be expressive. Ideally, feature identical to the server-side runtime. It should be portable. It should provide compatibility guarantees to support older and newer models. And it, ideally, it should be supported by various front-ends and support new model pushes in a matter of minutes. To my best knowledge, all the current solutions violate some of these requirements. And we are to this day shipping a stripped-down version of full TensorFlow cross-compiled for Android. You can imagine it um, doesn't check all the above boxes. The lack of a decent edge neural runtime is one of the major challenges that we and our customers face, and it does hinder usability and adoption of our system. So I'm pretty excited about um, investments in this area that we are seeing. I would like to conclude the talk here. Um, thank you for listening. Um, I, if there's time left, um, I think we have a Q&A session coming up. Thank you, Hubert. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so Hubert talked a lot about our production platform at Google. You may have also heard of TensorFlow Federated, which helps in production, but is also used for experimentation. And tomorrow, we're going to have a day dedicated towards demoing our latest and greatest research, both on federated learning analytics with personalization and differential privacy. We're doing these demos mostly focused on research, but we'll also show you snippets of TFF code of how you can easily get started. So please make sure to RSVP and attend. And now let's use a few minutes to do Q&A with Francoise, Ravi, and Hubert. So if you have any questions, please unmute, ask your question, or ask it in the chat box. There's a question for Hubert, so I'll start with that. 
Uh, Hubert, can you speak to some examples of bias that happens due to different participation by devices? I wonder if you can reverse engineer and work out details of the devices to remove the bias from the results. Um, examples of bias. Uh, we, in terms of actual, uh, actually bias statistics, those are somewhat hard to come by because it would require to have a ground truth signal that is different, right? So we would have to collect the same data twice, once with a federated system and once with um, some ideally unbiased system in order to even notice if there is uh, bias in the aggregated model or um, metric. Um, that is usually not possible because if you could collect the data without a federated system, why would you use a federated system? But we had one case uh, where we uh, generated um, artificial data and notice differences between such a ground truth system and the federated system. Um, even then, we are not sure whether that ground truth telemetry system we used is entirely unbiased either. Mm -hmm. If we can reverse engineer and work at the, let me read the question, if you can reverse engineer and work at the details of the devices um, to remove the bias from the results. Um, so there are different ways to address bias or remove bias. Um, one is you try to address um, the part differences in participation rates by having, for instance, using sampling without replacement or limiting how often devices participate. Another option is um, to weigh up or down contributions of devices based on how likely they are um, to participate, which in turn requires you to estimate first uh, what is the probability of a device to participate. Um, you could use its past history, or you could try to build a model of uh, that predicts how often a device will participate. Um, I hope that answered the question. Thanks, Hubert. Uh, there's also a question uh, for Francoise. Uh, could on-device removal of extra features in audio or sensitive features such as emotions, etc., be used for learner more accurate on device for learning more accurate on device models so there, there are two different points here i think one is a question of um you know the, what can be done technically and from that point of view of course you you could do whatever type of model training that you want the other question is what is acceptable to users and I think that if we want to train a model that goes into something so personal as your emotions, that is something that first would need to be surfaced to the users very prominently so that they know uh, what is happening and they have a way to opt into such a feature. Just the way that we did with Hot Word model, right? We, we did a very clear opt-in so that users would know that data that isn't necessarily meant for Google um, is kept on their device and they could decide whether they want it to be in or not. So it's mostly a question of communication with the user, I believe. Thank you. And there's a last quick question. I believe it's for Hubert. Um, would the platform considering ma malicious behaviors, does, does our platform consider uh, malicious behaviors such as data pollution? Um. Yes, uh, I think it's important here to distinguish different types of malicious behavior because different um, attack vectors will require different solutions to address them. There are some attack vectors that could be addressed um, at the, say, at the model level, clipping gradients, for instance. Um, there are other attack vectors that might um, be better uh, addressed at the platform level. Um, we have various attack vectors and um, address them to various extents at different levels of the platform or the model level. Thank you. If, uh, there, there seems to be more questions coming up. Uh, please continue, you know, pasting your questions into the chat box and uh, Hubert, Ravi, Francoise, keep an eye. Uh, but we have to move on to the academic keynote. Marco will be presenting our keynote speaker.